In a beautiful essay describing his experiences leading high holiday services, my friend and colleague, Rabbi Dr. Aaron Pankin, wrote the following. The high holidays were so difficult to get through as a congregational rabbi. Year after year, my voice would crack, my e eyes tear up. Some years took all I could just to get through the parts that I had to lead. It was impossible, he wrote, to stand before the families I knew and loved and avoid the deep, intimate sadness provoked by the demanding litany of who shall live and who shall die in all the variations of the High Holidays. It was all too much knowing that the family here who had lost an infant daughter that year, the young woman there struggling to survive what had been declared a terminal cancer, the dear friends in the back row coping, coping with the deepening dementia of parents, and those many individuals in the sanctuary whose lives were constantly in the throes of turmoil. To lead these words was to immerse and re-immerse oneself in the anguish enveloping so many of us and, inev and inevitably all of us eventually. Leading the High Holidays meant giving explicit voice to it all and dipping a toe into the fear and trembling attendant with it. It's a painfully beautiful essay, one that I recommend of what Rabbi Pankin describes as a challenge of living under the present, ever-present specter of death. And it's an essay that has taken on new and urgent meaning, as I've read it over and over again since Aaron, a recreational pilot, died in a plane crash on May 5th this past year. Survived by his wife Lisa and his two children, Aaron was a slightly older contemporary of mine, the president of Hebrew Union College, the training ground for the reform movements rabbis, cantors, educators, and scholars. There are those in this room who knew Aaron well. We were friends, but not intimates. My Debbie and Aaron worked together at Rodef Shalom on the west side years ago, and the fact that Aaron and I share both rabbinic and academic degrees always gave us plenty to talk about. During my sabbatical in the spring, I wrote daily at the HUC library. We actually had a lunch planned the week in which he passed. The four of us were supposed to go out later that month. Aaron was an institutional leader, a lover of the Jewish people, the embodiment in my mind of the rabbi scholar ideal and a huge mensch. He believed in the importance of civil dialogue, that people should listen and learn from each other, the importance of scholarship, that we need to ra keep raising the bar for the next generation of rabbis and educators and laity, and most of all, he believed in the infinite dignity of every human being. I will miss Aaron, as will the entire Jewish world. So at this moment of Yisker, it'll come to no surprise to you that I've been reading much of Aaron's work, and it's by way of his legacy that I want to frame my reflections at this time. It was Heschel who once wrote that the wisdom of philosophers are not mirrors reflecting other people's problems, but windows into an author's soul. Aaron's writing, likewise, undoubtedly reflected his passions and his soul. Aaron's doctoral thesis is called The Rhetoric of Innovation, Self-Conscious Legal Change in Rabbinic Literature. Aaron would have been the first to tell you that it's not exactly a page turner. I actually spoke to his wife earlier in the week and I asked her about the thesis, to which she responded, Elliot, I never read that. <laughs> but Aaron was the chief intellect of the reform movement, so it's not surprising that his major work should be a study of how Jewish law has developed, transformed, and reformed itself over the ages. Specifically, his thesis is a study of three terms, three terms that I'd like to lay out to you at this time. The first in Hebrew is barishona, literally translating as at first or, or in the beginning. Aaron characterizes this as the reflective tendency. Appearing over 400 times in rabbinic literature, it's used when rabbis want to describe how things were done in the past. 
how things used to be, how a practice at, arose barishona at first. Things aren't the same now as they were barishona. It's a term that self-consciously differentiates between then and now for the rabbis giving them permission to change. The second term Aaron studies is a Hebrew word takana. Takana literally means a repair or an enactment of the law. This is an explicitly innovative move by the rabbis, an announcement that a break with the past is happening, a time to introduce new prayers, new laws, new practices, customs, or regulations. The third term is to a certain degree just the opposite of the second, and in Hebrew it's gzeira, which means a decree. A gzeira is a conservation, a declaration to preserve an older law and to prevent that law's violation. It can reflect something new, but it's an innovation only in order to protect and preserve that which came before. A gzeira signals that no matter how much things change, there are some values, some practices, that are eternal and must be protected. Three terms, barishona, meaning back in the day, takana, the innovative tendency, and gzeira, a measure to preserve the past. Three rabbinic terms worthy of study and shape the intellectual mindset of my late friend. But today, at this moment of yisker, three terms that can shape our own task at hand how we recall, mourn, and honor the memories of those loved ones in our hearts and minds at this moment. The first step of Yisker, undoubtedly, is that of Barishona, back in the day. Let's begin by turning the lens of our attention to our loved ones and appreciate them in the moment of their lives, in the context in which they functioned. Oftentimes, we make the mistake of judging people according to the standards of our own day, our lives, and our own standards. But that's not really fair now, is it? We have to ask ourselves, what was it like for them to be children of immigrants? What was it like to grow up in the Depression, to be a Holocaust survivor, to live in a time of war, to face uncertainty, and fear. What was it like to grow up in that household in which my father, my mother grew up in? What were their challenges? What were their pressures? What were their failures? We often don't grant our loved ones the courtesy and the grace of appreciating their circumstances. Our loved ones, no different from us, were just doing the best they could under oftentimes difficult circumstances. It's not fair to judge them according to our own. Their lives should be appreciated by Rishona, as they were. Here at this moment of Yisker, we walk through the gallery of our loved one's lives, the relationships we nourished, the decisions that challenged them, and the sorrows we face. The first step of Yisker is a reflective one appreciating, understanding, honoring, and most of all, remembering Barishona. And then perhaps the second step is Takana. Yisker is not just a reflective, passive activity. It requires action on our part. The fact that we appreciate the context that gave rise to our loved one doesn't preclude us from realizing that we live in a different context, in a different time. It's okay to ask, how will my choices differ from theirs? How is my value system otherwise? How is my life not just an extension of theirs, but also a reaction against it? We study their lives, we are grateful for them, but we also know that we ourselves, no different than they did in their own time, get to chart out our own path. Takana comes from the root meaning to fix something. For many in this room, the act of yisker is not situated solely on remembering, but it's also the act of fixing, differentiating our lives from theirs to form our own identity. In another essay, Aaron makes the point that every act of memory in the Bible 
with Noah, with Abraham, with Rachel, is also an act of creation. We remember, but we remember in order to create our lives. We know that we need to live lives that are authentic to who we are, and thus one day worthy of remembrance. And then finally is Gezeira. Maybe at this time of Yisker, these are the measures we need to take to preserve memory, to preserve the past. Every day, but especially on this day, we know that we are links in a chain of tradition. There are the customs, the recipes, the traditions, and most importantly, the values that were dear to those in our hearts at this time that are worthy of being protected, perpetuated beyond the span of years of our loved ones. In another of Aaron's essays, he explains, none of us ultimately know the length of our days, only that this world is an ephemeral one. And yet, he explains, our actions help us live in such a way that when we suffer life's darkest depredations, we will have ways of coping with them. Our actions don't change the ultimate outcome, but they alter our attitude, bolster our ability to withstand challenges, help us to handle unavoidable misfortunes better, and see life's value amid chaos and dismay. Aaron's essay concludes by pointing out the dialectic of the holiday season, the ephemeral and the eternal, that while our lives as human beings are fleeting, we can, by reaching out towards God and the bounty of our lives and values that transcend any one life in time, we can, in our own small way, protect the past and reach and enter eternity. This ultimately is our task right now. We must appreciate our loved ones' lives, Barishona, in their moment. And yes, we must be willing to change, Takana. We are not them and they are not us. But our task and responsibility now is how we in the short time we have on this earth can serve as worthy vessels of preservation for the highest values of those whom we remember today. Our parents, our siblings, our children, our spouses, our family and friends who are in our hearts always and especially now. We honor them by living their values. We honor them by making those values real for us and for generations to come. Aaron's life in the all too brief 53 years touched eternity. He preserved the past and he wrote his own script. I wish to God it were otherwise, but it isn't. So in the wake of this passing, I ask in this Yisker, how will I, in the span allotted to me, help perpetuate the values by which he lived? And so too, each one of us, as we recall our loved ones at this time, in this sacred Yisker hour, how shall we reach out to touch eternity? A time to remember, a time to create, a time to honor those who came before us, a time to honor the living, it is a time for Yisker.